how's everybody doing? Well, I'm coming to you this week from the Guilty Pleasures corner amid the palatial estate of my bedroom. Uh, but, yeah, I thought I'd try to do something a little different in terms of um, the overall films that uh, I'm talking about. I mean, one can sit here on YouTube all day and um, and talk to their heart's content about the really great horror films. And I do believe that there are many great horror films out there. Um, horror films that um, <laughs> enlighten and as well as entertain. But uh, this week, as the title suggests, we're dealing with guilty pleasures. Uh, films that I might not be overly aggressive ordinarily about talking about or even saying that I like or that I own, but um, we're going to do it just as a change of pace, see how it goes. And uh, so I now present them to you in no particular order. Um, the first one's a Karloff film. Yay, Karloff! Um, Sad to say, even though this is a film that hails from um, the era of, of Hollywood's golden age of horror during the 1930s, this film uh, is not only not a ho Hollywood horror film, but uh, it was produced in, in uh, England. Um, but it's, um, it's not a film I would necessarily recommend in terms of saying, that's a great horror film! It tries. Gosh, it sure tries. It's entitled The Ghoul. And um, for many years it was thought to be a lost film. Uh, fortunately, it was not. And I say that because it has become a guilty pleasure of mine. Uh, one, because it's a Karloff film. And it was made uh, very early on after his uh, great success in uh, both Frankenstein and The Mummy. Uh, this film, however, well, it's got an amazing cast. I mean, it's, it's, it's uh, along with Karloff, it, it stars um, Ernest Thessinger, who was, uh, of course, uh, a principal player in The Bride of Frankenstein and The Old Dark House. Um, it was also Sir Ralph Richardson's very first motion picture role. Uh, very young fellow that he was, and plays a kind of a small supporting part. Um, there are there are some things that you can point to with this film to say, well, yeah, it's got some things going for it. Um, but in the end, it, it turns into kind of a silly exercise. Um, and I say that with all the love in my heart, <laughs> because I find myself watching this film from time to time and really enjoying it, even though it's uh, it's silly. Um, it concerns a fellow who's decided that, uh, well, he's a devotee of the Egyptian uh, religions and wants to be, you know, uh, carried into the afterlife in, in, in fine fashion along with various other uh, practitioners of, of those religions. Um, and it's it's one of those films that, uh, if I'm not spoiling anything, because it's, you know, come on, I mean, the journey is the thing, not, not, not the destination. But it is one of those films that ends up uh, being a huge gotcha, you know, in, in the sense that you know, a lot of horror films in 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 uh, the early days and even throughout time would get to the end and find, oh, it wasn't anything su supernatural going on at all. It was actually completely logical and explainable, and they go on to attempt to do so. Anyway, I I still like it. Now, here's another one. This is uh, from sometime in the early 1940s, maybe 1943. Uh, entitled uh, Dead Men Walking. And it stars uh, George Zucco and um, Dwight Fry. 
And uh, this was actually one of Dwight Fry's very last films um, before it passed away. Uh, and of course, uh, anybody who knows anything about the golden age of horror will know Dr Dwight Fry, even if you don't know his name. You do know him, because he became famous or infamous, whatever you prefer, for having played Renfield in the original 1931 Dracula, and um, the same year playing Fritz, the hunchback assistant to Dr. Frankenstein in Frankenstein. Um, but in this, he plays a kind of a Renfield knockoff, actually. George Zucco plays a dual role of a good brother and a bad brother. And the good brother is just too good to be true, and the bad brother is a vampire! And he comes back from the dead, walking the night, uh, you know, uh, skulking amongst the mist, uh, peeking in people's windows, how rude! Uh, and uh, Dwight Fry is his uh, sort of uh, hunchback caretaker who does all of his dirty work in terms of preserving his crypt space and seeing to it that he's safe during the daylight hours and all that kind of thing. Well, it was produced at one of the Poverty Row uh, movie studios. And uh, I gotta say, I gotta say again, you know, uh, constructive criticism. Uh, the sets are just about as cardboard as some of the acting in this thing. <laughs> again, I can't help it. I I just I just have a, a, a fondness for this film. So I find myself again watching it from time to time. I might even watch it tonight. Uh, but it is on YouTube. If uh, anybody cares to look it up, <laughs> you know. Waste 67 minutes of your life? Be my guest. Okay, here's another one. Bride of the Gorilla. Yes, I got the title right. Uh, this one stars Raymond Burr, a very young Raymond Burr, um, and Lon Chaney Jr. And it was written and directed by the fellow who wrote the screenplay for the original Wolfman. And it is, some people say, a sort of an unofficial remake of The Wolfman, only instead of a man turning into a wolf, that inv this involves a man turning into a gorilla. And it is written very much as the original Wolfman script was written in that it, it leaves you wondering, is this really happening? Is this really happening? I mean, is this guy really turning into a wolf, or in this case, uh, a gorilla? Or is it just in his mind? Um, yes, yeah, so that is definitely um, the way the original Wolfman was uh, executed in the earlier drafts. And then, at the last minute, I suppose the, you know, production heads decided, no, we need a real monster, no screwing around. Well. This film is very much, I think, uh, sort of done as a, a, an alternate version of that. Um, and uh, ironic that um, even though Raymond Burr is the star of the film and uh, is, is quite good in it, despite the kind of silly plotline, um, uh, Lon Chaney Jr., who became a real huge star in uh, uh, in playing the Wolfman. Has his little bit part. It's a little more than a bit part. Uh, and uh, he's sort of the conscience of the jungle. Uh, you know, in, in grand romantic terms. And he also happens to be the local sheriff. So, uh, nice to, to uh, combine romance and, um, you know, hard nails, real life, gritty stuff. Um, so, yeah, you know, I, I enjoy it. Uh, and it's a film I didn't actually get to see until kind of late in life, so it was a, sort of a, a, a late bloom, you might say, or, a <laughs> or you might say something else, huh? Okay. Well, okay. 
on to something else. This film, I used to get up in the middle of the night when I was a kid and turn on the all night movie and watch the guy selling cars. Um, and they would show this movie a lot. And I really developed a fondness for it. The Bat, starring Vincent Price, also starring um, Agnes Moorhead, who's, who was a wonderful actress. Uh, just If you want to really see an amazing portrayal, uh, see her in the Magnificent Ambersons. Oh my gosh. She is all over that damn movie. Just <laughs> all sorts of mood swings. But it's a magnificent performance. But, well, this is a pretty good performance, too. Um, despite the fact that it was produced at another one of the uh, uh, Poverty Row uh, Hollywood studios. Uh, you know, a lot of these, are, well, most of these are B-pictures, or it used to be referred to as B-pictures. But yes, um, there have been many film versions of this, and this one gets bad-mouthed on a regular basis. But as I say, I grew up, you know, those wonderful memories of sitting there at four in the morning before the sun comes up, watching this movie, watching the bat creep around, wondering, you know, who, who the bat was, you know? The bat is, you know, a, a sort of a burglar and murderer, dressed with, uh, you know, all in black, with claws jutting out of their gloves, and um, uh, no face. And it's very creepy. But you're wondering, is it Vincent Price? Well, of course it must be Vincent Price. Or maybe it's not Vincent Price. Well, maybe it's someone else. And, it, you know, it's, uh, you know, lots of, uh, you know theatrics go on, um, you know, lots of melodrama, uh, but it's a fun movie. I enjoy it very much. And uh, still, to this day, can give it a look and uh, have a good time. Okay, we're really getting into uh, <laughs> some treacherous territory here. This, um, this is uh, actually the, the premium copy of a rather silly movie, uh, which was entitled The Robot vs. The Aztec Mummy. Okay, with a title like that, you just know it's quality. Um, I remember in Stephen King's um, horror history book, Dance Macabre, um, he spoke of, you know, watching this film among others and some of the late night horror fests of the 19, early 1960s and, and things, and um, <laughs> you see what it did to him, right? So, uh, but yeah, um, oh, this is just way too silly. It's just silly beyond words, um, but I'm going to try, okay? A mad scientist supervillain decides that he must have some artifact that is guarded by this monstrous Aztec mummy. And so he creates a robot that will go in there who cannot be harmed by the Aztec mummy and all of its supernatural powers uh, and, and, and go in there and uh, retrieve the artifact and uh, bring it back to him and uh, he will rule the world or some... Uh, you know, whatever. Uh, <laughs> it's very silly. And uh, the dubbing is uh, equally silly. But, you know, hey... What can I say, you know? I mean, there's um, lots of babes with a cleavage in these films. So, yeah, anyway. So, that's, that's kind of a, that's an example of uh, some of the things that I would consider uh, guilty pleasures. And uh, Well, with that, I will close and I will wish you all a wonderful weekend. Thanks for watching and I'll talk to you later.